Hi, my name is Adam Butler. I work with John Deere. I've been working with John Deere for approximately 16 years. Um, like most of you, I've got my quarantine feral beard going, so I apologize for my, my uh, appearance at Sign of the Times. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about our journey to scale and process millions of measurements a second. A little bit about John Deere. Um, we are obviously involved in agricultural equipment. As you may or may not know, we also have divisions involved in construction, turf equipment, and forestry. A little bit about our mission, uh, our purpose. We're committed to those who are linked to the land. Um, we will help our customers, those who cultivate, harvest, transform, enrich, or build upon the land. Um, essentially, we recognize that the global population is increasing, the arable land is fixed, we need to grow more with less. We need to help our producers um, continue to optimize their operations. Um, I specifically work for the John Deere Intelligence Solution Group, which is involved in precision agriculture. Um, this is some of the technology that we develop, um, AutoTrack in this case, which is helping this machine guide without user interaction uh, precisely through that field between two previous passes. And in this case, these machines can communicate with, with each other to ensure that they don't overlap and also um, precisely deploy their cargo into that grain cart. Um, my particular group is involved in uh, processing sensor data for the purposes of precision analysis. Um, that operational data comes in, we rasterize it for that precision analysis and visualization. A grower might want to work with their agronomist, do analysis on their data, and understand how they can improve their operations year over year. Why was this part of the field underperforming versus that part of the field? What decisions did we make and how can we improve upon those? Um, our resolution at, uh, at, at a highest level is 0.14 meters per cell uh, on a 256 by 256 cell raster. So that's approximately a post-it note. Um, a pixel represents a post-it note. And we can take all this spatial data that we've rasterized and perform near real-time evaluation by combining and visualizing it um, via a robust API. So you might want to combine your harvest data, your seeding data, your speed map, and your soil type and understand exactly what your yield was, um, where the machine was traveling between three and five kilometers on a silty load. We also, in addition to that precise an analysis, we also provide APIs for doing large scale analysis. So if a grower wants to know across their entire operation, what was the average yield of all their fields? Um, how have they done year over year on any given set of fields? Um, large scale data processing is possible via um, um, a data product we put in Elasticsearch for real time aggregation. And we have over 3 billion uh, of those different layers stored in our system that our growers can, our customers can use to aggregate. So let me start to talk through our, our journey. Um, and we're going to go back to 2014. And we're actually going to talk not about agronomic data initially, but machine state data. And in this case, we're going to be processing approximately 5,000 measurements a second. So what is machine state data? Machine state data could be things like RPMs, um, oil temperature, engine temperature, anything about the state of the machine. Um, the data is captured and aggregated into a single record that represents 30 minutes. So it's a 30 minute summary of what has occurred on that machine. Um, we would typically get about 250 records a second across it in the entire active fleet of machines. And each record could contain approximately 20 different measurements. Sometimes it can be higher, sometimes lower. 20 is pretty typical. And as a result, we're looking at about 5,000 measurements a second. So what was our architecture like? Um, it was very classic 2014 AWS service list architecture. Lambda, Kinesis, DynamoDB, S3. All of this is written in Scala, and the data was aggregated into buckets of time. So we would receive these documents, we'd aggregate them by machine into a six hour bucket um, uh, data product, and then we would take those data products and aggregate them into day data products, then week, then month, then year, and then lifetime. This allowed clients of our API to request arbitrary date ranges that minimize the number of actual files that we needed to retrieve and process. Um, good and bad. So this worked. Um, our customers were happy. The system could scale well with spikes up to five times. Uh, it, there was a large volume of additional machines that entered the system. 
um, the bad. Um, if you've worked with Lambda and had to do any kind of state management, it can be challenging, especially back in 2014. Um, it's also hard to troubleshoot and debug. Um, you know, our logic was distributed across many, many different serverless uh, lambdas that were running. Uh, logging was a little rough in 2014 on CloudWatch. Um, it was just hard to operationally maintain the system. Um, 2016, so we were dealing with about 5,000 records a second system uh, or machine data. Now we're looking to do, they said, this works so well, let's do agronomic data. It's a little bit bigger, 75,000 measurements a second. We also don't aggregate our agronomic data by time. We aggregate it by space. Um, again, back to what we, what we allow our customers to do with this is that spatial analysis. We need to identify the specific bucket that this data belongs in. Um, we're using the Bing uh, map style system, Quadtree. Um, we typically, at this point, we're operating at level 21. So there's like 7 trillion level 21s in the United States alone. So there's a lot of potential locations that these um, files can live in. Um, and now we're not dealing with machine state. We're actually dealing with operational data. So what was happening in the field, what was happening uh, and how we interacted with the field. So in this case of an exact emerge planner, they might be 16, uh, it might be a 16 row planner. So each row has its own center, sensor. Uh, we're capturing data once a second, and there's approximately 15 sensor readings uh, on each row. So that means each machine is producing about 250 measurements per second, and we are getting about 5,000 of those records uh, every second. So there's about 75,000 measurements coming in every second that we need to process. Um, and I want to talk for a second real quickly about what's typical in agronomic. Um, a typical field is, let's say, a field in central Iowa. It's 48 acres. It's about a quarter of a, a mile. It's kind of your, your very classic field. Uh, one and a half million corn plants on that field, two billion kernels. And um, those level 21 titles this field gets broken down into about 100,000 of those, three foot by three foot tiles. Um, this is in stark contrast to say Western Kansas where you might have a thousand acre field, or you go to Brazil or Eastern Ukraine and now you're looking at 10,000 acre fields. Um, typicals, hard, there isn't really typical. Um, it really going to vary a great deal based on where you are in the world, what you're growing and how you're growing it. Uh, and that makes data processing challenging. Um, we also have to deal with the fact that our machines aren't always connected. Um, we have uh, growers that have older machines that aren't connected. So they're capturing data, but they have no means to do it, uh, upload that data. So they're capturing it and storing it on a thumb drive and then upload it at the end of the day. Even if they are connected, they might find themselves going out of coverage. Um, there's not necessarily good cell coverage at every single field. Or if the ground is not perfectly flat, like you see in Brazil, they enter gullies. They enter areas where that cell tower, even if it's nearby, has trouble reaching. So these machines have to queue data up and, and, and produce micro batches. So we get streams of data, we get batches of data, and we get large batches of data, and we get them for all different kinds of fields. Um, as that data is coming in, we're trying to um, statefully process it. We need to make sure we don't um, get the wrong data in the wrong fields or the wrong data with the wrong operation. Uh, we need to group that related data. We need to handle data that arrives later. Um, we also want to ensure we don't double the process data. We, we don't want to count data twice. All of that results in complexity. Um, this is that Lambda architecture. This isn't necessarily mean, meant to be something like for you to understand and study. The point is it's complex. It's hard to understand. It's hard to deal with. And it was making it very hard to um, successfully process this data. Um, the good and the bad. It was working mostly. Uh, kind of talk about the Netflix versus Blu-ray. Blu-ray was perfect fidelity. Netflix was lossy. This data was kind of lossy. The customers were sort of happy. Um, they were getting things that they wanted, but there were lots of problems. Uh, there'd be gaps in imagery. Anything that went wrong at AWS, at the scale we were operating in, um, Lambda throttles, S3 throttles, DynamoDB throttles, all of those things could result in some small part of that system failing records going to some dead letter queue and maybe in a gap in your image. Um, also storage requirements are huge. So all those files are creating and all those spatial buckets were adding up very quickly. We're getting hundreds of terabytes of data. 
So the system isn't really scaling, it's struggling, it's hard to maintain, and we're gonna go now from 75,000 measurements a second to 255,000 measurements a second. So wow, we, we're having a hard time keeping up already and the volumes of data keep going up. So what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna move away from Lambda. We're going to start doing this using uh, batch processing using EMR Spark. So we're gonna read data out of, S, out of uh, fire hose buckets in S3, process it via Spark, and then write it back out to S3 again. Again, the language of Scala. Um, the good and the bad here, what, what was, this worked. Um, you know, we were able to, especially it was pretty cool, we were able to take all that code that we wrote for those lambdas and just make them EMR steps. Uh, data quality was good. We weren't having the same throttling issues, so we weren't getting the lossiness. Um, we could scale. Um, you know, if we needed to scale horizontally, we could spin up multiple clusters. Uh, we were supporting essentially 17,000 records per second per cluster, um, which is 255,000 readings a second. If we went above that, we could just spin up additional clusters. So our customers were sort of happy. What was the problem? Well, it was slow. It took about three hours for each job to run. Customers really wanted their data a little bit less than 10 minutes after they uploaded it, and that was them being generous. Um, and at this point, the storage requirements just keep going up. Uh, we were only processing about 7% of our data, and we were taking up seven petabytes of, of space. So that was going to be a, a very expensive challenge. Uh, we also had instance contention. Um, if we were using Spot, you could lose your cluster. Um, and, and if you've worked with Spark, uh, you know how painful it is to have your, your job fail minutes before it was over, um, especially because of something like a Spot instance failure. Um, but if you know there were things going on in the world, elections, Black Friday, Stranger Things, that could take away from our pool. Um, we were using a lot of compute, so this was this was uh, this was a problem, um, and it was more expensive than Lambda. Um, uh, you know, we're we're running big clusters a lot. So we've got a solution. It's working, but it's not really. People aren't happy, and it's expensive. We're processing two hundred fifty-five thousand measurements a second. And then 2018, that goes up, 12 million measurements a second. So this was us. Um, and despite his reaction, it probably really wasn't a surprise, but it was still, um, how, do we, how are we gonna solve this? What are we gonna do? So why did this happen? How did we go from 255,000 to 12 million? Well, for one thing, um, our technology is getting um, more detailed. Um, in this case, our planner went from 16 units to 32. It's sampling five times a second instead of one time a second. Still getting 15 sensor readings. This machine is now producing 2,400 measurements a second versus 240. And there's more machines. More and more machines are getting connected. This is a snapshot of harvest season last year um, where we had approximately 5,000 active sessions at once. That's 12 million measurements per second we were getting. Um, or 720 million measurements in 60 seconds. It's a lot of data. So what are we gonna do? We can't do it uh, via Lambda. We can't do it via batch in, in EMR. Um, so what are we gonna do? We rethink the data, rethink the process. Are we even making the right things? We can't pre-build and store everything in S3. It's just too expensive. It's just taking too long. Instead, what if we build something simpler? Um, the fact of the matter is all this data we're processing, a lot of it never gets looked at. So maybe we could be a little smarter and build just enough that we could respond to customer demands, uh, request, customer requests on demand. We also split it out. So everything was going in S3 before. Now we're gonna start moving some metadata to Aurora and build data in S3. And for our summaries and totals, we're no longer gonna store those in S3. We're also gonna put those on Elasticsearch so we could do aggregations on the fly. Um, in this case, we've introduced a new technology called EMR Flink. This is from Apache. Uh, this allows you to do stateful stream processing. Um, so simple, very overly simplified architecture here. But we have two streams of data, sensor data and session data. Um, session data is basically sensor data, but put together into a single file. Um, but we then take that data, split it out into the individual records. We then compute the spatial positions, we then do a key by operation in Flink and using a window, a session, and a tile key. And then we sync the results to S3 and Aurora. Um, good, so it worked. The storage was way down. So we were at seven petabytes for 7% of our customers. Now we're at two, tetabytes, two 
petabytes for all customer data. It's still a lot. It's still a lot of data, but it's 2% of what it would have been. Um, and we've now processed 67 trillion measurements. We've done it multiple times, which is, um, you know, there's been issues, there's been enhancements we wanted to do, so we've had to go through that data and, and process it multiple times. Um, the system is also fast. Uh, the data comes in, we can process it and have it ready for our customers in, in minutes. Bad. Um, well, it doesn't auto scale. EMR doesn't auto scale. So if we exceed our capacity, um, it was a lot harder to scale up horizontally. Plink's also kind of hard to operationally manage. Um, this is a lot of overhead there. Part of that is us. Um, our state was just too large. We've um, and if things ever had any kind of back pressure, our state would explode, and which meant that some of the features that Flink are really good at, like recovery via checkpoints or save points, we can never leverage. Um, it was also more expensive than batch. This was a very large cluster running 24-7. Um, and then our API response times were now slower. So um, we've pushed a lot of the commute to on-demand. Customers were basically doing real-time map reduce. This was good enough to buy us some time but it still wasn't good enough for what the customers needed. Moving into agronomic uh, streaming in 2020, we're now looking at a 5x increase in machines. So the volumes of data just keep going up. Yeah, yeah, this is was, this was what we were like. What were we going to do? So a little bit of everything. Uh, first, we started to push back on SLA because everything needed to be processed exactly the same. Did we swing this pendulum too far in the direction of not processing enough? We can't pre-generate everything, but we also can't make everything on demand. Maybe we need to find a happy medium. We also, um, we, we don't want to, we need to start processing by batch where possible. We can't stream everything. And then we also started to reintroduce Lambda. Are there some things that we could use Lambda for that are cheap, uh, where we don't need to worry about state? And, and that's been helpful. Um, I brought this picture back up because this is, where we, before we were taking streams of data, micro batches and large batches and turning everything into a stream, we're kind of doing the opposite now. We're taking streams, micro batches and batches and turning everything into batches. Um, and then we've moved our logic to ECS. So we've moved off EMR, we've moved off Flink, now we're on ECS. And um, the good, so this isn't a replacement for Flink application, that's still running, but this is our stream-based batch processing. We're now pre-rasterizing pre-rasterizing operations. So we are back to that original data product, but much more smart, uh, much more intelligently <laughs> building those structures. So we're, we're being more focused on what we built. Um, we've been able to reduce our API load times from 15 seconds to one second, and we can still get through the data fast, where it takes about 15 seconds per operation to process it. It's operationally far simpler than Flink and ECS auto scales. Um, so we're able to keep up with our data streams. This is all good news. Uh, the bad, well, we're now managing two different ingestion engines. Um, we're also only pre-rasterizing things that we believe customers commonly use. Everything else is still going to be using the, the existing data products and that slower, uh, slower APIs that our Flink app produces. Um, it's also, we're, we're expensive. We're storing a lot more stuff in S3 again, so that pendulum has slowed back. It's also a lot more compute. Um, these are, again, big clusters doing a lot of computation. Beyond 2020, what, what are we gonna, this is, what's the, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna continue to evolve our system? Um, we're gonna be very carefully tuning what we pre-generate. Um, we will likely re-architect our streaming data pipeline again. Um, we've done a lot of evaluation of GPUs. There's probably some opportunities to leverage them. Um, right now, our biggest issue is IO, so GPU doesn't buy us a lot, but we think there's some, some good opportunities there um, in the future. Um, we're looking at time series databases, Something else entirely, to be honest. There's new technologies every day. There's a lot of opportunities to try new things. Um, the trends, um, and this is just, we're gonna be doing it. There's just gonna be more machines. They're gonna be connected more often. They will have more sensors. The data will be higher density, higher frequency, lower latency, and our customers need actionable insights quickly. So how do we continue to um, evolve the system to keep up with that demand? Um, that's my talk. I probably went pretty fast through some of it. I appreciate everyone taking the time to watch.